Very good. All right. All right, welcome. Come on in. It's always nice to see people chatting out in the, in the lobby area. Uh, come on and gather in. It's good to be with you this morning, and i um, glad the road's cleared up enough. It was a little icy yesterday. But uh, welcome, and uh, hey, welcome to those of you joining us online. And if you're joining us online, hey, go ahead and say hello in the comments. It's always nice to uh, see uh, hello, and it's always great to see where people are joining us from. If you're uh, new or you just want to get connected with fellowship in some way, I encourage you to fill out the connect card in the pew and let us know how we can be praying for you or we can help you get into a discipleship group. We'd love to help you grow as a disciple of Jesus Christ in any way that we can. So this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us begin our time of worship. Good morning. I invite you to stand with us. Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Yet the humble hear and be glad. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your continued goodness. We thank you that you invite us, Lord, into your presence as we come to worship. We just give you this hour now. We thank you uh, for, again, your faithfulness, Lord. We thank you for sustaining us through another week, and we just pray now that this uh, worship would be honoring and uh, bring glory to your name. We give it to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's begin singing, When Morning Gilds the Skies, May Jesus Christ Be Praised.
hearts this morning. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Sunday as we uh, ordain and install our new class of uh, ruling elders and deacons. And uh, so I'm going to invite if, uh, our new elders and deacons to come up here to the front. And as I do, I uh, encourage you to take out the handout that's in your bulletin. And let's read about the ordination and installation of elders and deacons. So Fellowship Evangelical Presbyterian Church is governed by this session and is served by a deacon board which, under authority of the session, carries out duties of compassion and love assigned to it by the session. According to Scripture, those who bear the office of ruling elder should be blameless in life, sound in faith, wise in the things of God, and discreet in all things. Together, the ruling elders watch over the spiritual welfare of the congregation. It is the first duty of the ruling elder to seek and represent the mind of Christ, as the law of love places certain duties upon each Christian, the ruling elder is especially bound to fulfill the duties and to be an example to all. According to scripture, those who bear the office of deacon should especially exhibit the spiritual qualities of steadfastness or steadiness and reliability. The first duty of the deacon is sympathy and service, and together the board of deacons carries out the ministry of compassion. As the law of love places certain duties upon each Christian, the deacon is especially bound to fulfill those duties and to be an example to all. So today, um, we are going to ordain two new deacons, Chip and Julie Stark, and then we're going to install our other officers who have been previously ordained. And so, Chip and Julie, uh, we get to put you on the spot here for the first set of questions. <laughs> Let me actually have you, uh, I want you guys to scoot down this way, and... Uh, Oh, well, you guys take a few steps over there. There you go. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and your job is to say, I do. All right. Uh, the members of this congregation have elected you to this high office, and you are now required to answer the following prescribed questions. Do you affirm your faith in Jesus Christ as your own personal Lord and Savior? If so, say, I do. Do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be uniquely and fully inspired by the Holy Spirit, and the supreme and final authority in all matters on which it speaks. Do. do you sincerely receive and adopt the Westminster Confession of Faith and the catechisms of this church as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures? Do, do you promise that if at any time you find yourself out of accord with any of the essentials of the faith, you will, on your own initiative, make known to your church session the change which has taken place in your views since the assumption of this ordination vow? I do. do you affirm and adopt the essentials of our faith without exception? I do. do you subscribe to the government and discipline of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church? I do. And do you promise subjection to your fellow presbyters in the Lord? Yes, sir. Wonderful. All right, now we come to installation. So the rest of this line has previously been ordained to one of these offices before, so we are reinstalling, sort of activating them again. And so here are the activation questions now for all of you. Uh, please uh, respond with I do. Do you now refer, reaffirm the vows you took upon your ordination, and do you uh, re recommit yourself to them in the discharge of your obligations? Have you been induced, as far as you know, your own heart, to accept the office of elder or deacon from love of God and sincere desire to promote his glory in the gospel of his son? Do you promise to be zealous and faithful in promoting the truths of the gospel and the purity and peace of the church, whatever persecution or opposition may arise to you on that account? Will you seek to be faithful and diligent in the exercise of all your duties as elder or deacon, whether personal or relative, private or public, and to endeavor by the grace of God to adorn the profession of the gospel in your manner of life and to walk with exemplary piety before this congregation of which God will make you an officer? Are you willing to take responsibility in the life of this congregation as an elder and deacon, and will you seek to discharge your duties relying upon the grace of God in such a way that the entire church of Jesus Christ will be blessed? Now, 
If that's no small task, I turn to the congregation and ask you, do you, the members of this congregation, continue to receive these persons as ruling elders and deacons, and do you continue your promise to yield to them all and all your officers all that honor, encouragement, encouragement, and obedience in the Lord to which the ordination as an officer entitles them according to the word of God and the constitution of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church? If so, say I do, or we do. There you go, wonderful. Now, by the authority of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church and the church session of this congregation, I declare that Jeff Jowett and Jeff Crott and Carlos Salgado and Frank Severn have been installed into the office of ruling elder, and Lisa O'Keefe and Chip and Julie Stark, along with Kent Samanzik, have been installed and ordained uh, into the office of deacon, agreeable to the word of God and the laws of this church. As, uh, as, they, as such, they are entitled to be given support, encouragement, honor, and obedience in the Lord, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And so as a token of support, we extend to you the right hand of fellowship, and we welcome you as officers of the church. <laughs> One second. Good morning. morning. So this morning we welcome one of our missionaries, uh, Dave Koistra. Dave is our second generation missionary that Fellowship has support. Uh, Previously, Fellowship supported his parents. Uh, And Dave now continues the the ministry, specifically with JARS. So Dave, welcome to Fellowship. Thank you. Great. Hey, it's really awesome to be here. Um, I've been coming here since I was a little kid. Not very often, but, you know, every few years I've been back here. And I bring greetings from my wife, my kids, and my father, who knows many of the older people in the congregation. So, um, but it's it's so great to be here. My, My son, who's 14, texted me this morning. He said, good luck, Dad. (laughs) <laughs> and, and, and he knows that I get really nervous in, when I go speak at churches. Um, and I texted him back, this is fellowship, it's okay. And um, so I really do feel en casa, at home here. And um, I just thank you all for years of support. And it was really cool. I walked in the front door, and no less than five people met me and said, hey, I, I prayed for you either this morning or I've been praying for you. And that really, really means a lot. Um, really means a lot. Uh, Carlos asked me to share briefly what we do. Um, I, I'm an aviation mechanic and an instructor, and we are part of Wycliffe Bible Translators. Wycliffe is a large mission that works in many countries around the world whose goal is to translate the Bible into the indigenous language, languages of the world. Um, we believe that God's word really speaks to people best when it's in their heart language, and, and I get really excited about that, and that's what the church gets really excited about. Um, We happen to use aviation in a few countries in the world where things are really hard to reach, really hard to get to. Uh, We don't love aviation. We we use aviation because it's a necessity in these countries. I'm an aviation mechanic. I help keep those planes safe. Um, We worked for seven years in the Philippines, seven years in Peru, and now we've been back in the U.S. and North Carolina for almost eight years. And my current role is an instructor and evaluator for new recruits. So when new guys come, not only for Wycliffe, but for other big missions like AMER and South American Mission, we take them in, we evaluate them, and then we spend months training them for kind of the unique things that we face in mission aviation around the world. So I'm excited about that. We miss our time overseas, but we, we're really excited about what we get to do and invest in these lives of these, of these young men and women uh, before they head overseas. So if you want to hear more about it, I'll be telling more about it in the Sunday School Hour. Thank you, Dave. So... Please stay for Sunday School Hour. Um, they will be sharing a little bit more or more details about this ministry. Uh, Dave, is there anything uh, that we should be praying for you? Um, that's a big question. We've got, we've got four kids, and they're always on our hearts. Two of our girls, my daughter, my oldest daughter got married this last summer. My second daughter's in college. Um, all the normal things that you would be praying for your kids, we would, we would wish that you'd pray for our kids. Um, 
our lives in many ways, now that we're back in the States, look very similar to yours, I imagine. So when you think of us, think of your family and all the similar things that you'd be praying for your family. We'd appreciate prayers for that. Thank you, Dave. You see, Dave, uh, Dave was born in Panama, mm -hmm. grew up in Colombia, and I thought I was going to be able to do this in Spanish until I realized, oh, it's only two of us. So, <laughs> Anyway, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and honor to your name because you have put in this heart the desire to support our missionaries out there in the field. Father, we praise you because there's a whole ministry, there's a whole team uh, that backs Dave, all the way from the Holy Spirit, through Jesus Christ, to the different ministries that they support out there. Father, I pray that your kingdom continue to be extended, that your word continue to be delivered to, to the ends of this world. And we pray for him and his family as they carry out the ministry that you have put in their hearts. Thank you, Father, for your grace in Christ Jesus. Amen. So stay around for Sunday school. Thank you. just had a realization that apparently I'm old because I know uh, Dave's parents. <laughs> They've been around for a long time, but uh, yeah, it's always good to know these things. Um, today our scripture reading is in 1 Corinthians 15, and that's on page 961 in your Bible. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, and today we're going to read verses 12 through 20. The word of the Lord. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope, in, his life, in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today with grateful hearts. We look around us and we can say, praise God. Why is this the case in the world that we live in that's surrounded by pain, hardship, war, hate, fear, hunger, and unrest? We have you, Lord, who covers us with your love and protection. We know that whatever is happening, we can find safety in you. The world can look at us as if we're crazy and even blind. But Lord, we ask you that you give them a sense of wondering and questioning. What is different about these Christians? We live in the same world with all of its problems, but you help us and please help us reflect your light and encouragement to those around us. We ask if they come through our doors and see imperfections, that we embrace that fact and acknowledge that all have fallen short and need forgiveness. We are here because we need it, not because we don't. Lord, we acknowledge before you that our sin is great and we ask for your forgiveness now. You know that we wrestle with thoughts and words and deeds that are not aligned with your perfection and will, we silently ask you for our forgiveness, for your forgiveness now. Lord, we thank you for the spilt blood that atones for our sins. And we thank you that your love and sacrifice is greater than whatever we could do. We don't make this concept up, this cleansing that you provide, 
It is repeatedly made clear in the scriptures. Lord, as we read in, in your word, Psalm 32, verse 5, I acknowledge my sin to you, and I did not cover my iniquity. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Praise God, and thank you, Lord, that you freely forgive, and we are not left to our own devices. Lord, we thank you for the truth that we read in 1 Corinthians. Jesus was, in fact, raised from the dead, and our hope and our future are secure if we truly believe and accept the free gift of grace that you provide. Lord, we are still living in this world, and we experience everything in it with everyone else. We lift up those who mourn and hunger or who have emotional, financial, or spiritual battles today. We know that you are greater than all, and you are the great provider. Please touch each and every one of us where we need you today. We lift up our elders and deacons today. Lord, please let this be a season of renewal and following your guidance and will for fellowship. Lord, we especially lift up uh, Pastor Allen and Meredith and family today. Please give them support, give them guidance, and help sustain them in their life balance with between family and church obligations. Lord, we lift up our international and local supported missionaries and missions. We thank you that Dave Koyster could be with us today and please bless his ministry in North Carolina, behind the scenes, but yet very important to all the missions. Lord, we also lift up today the Judeans in Malaysia, help their love for the Malay people be attractive to the Malay people, and give the Judeans fruit and encouragement that they may need today. Their needs are unique to them and unknown fully to us, but Lord, you know that, their, that your strength is enough and sufficient for them. Locally, we lift up our church family. We lift up those who, in our church body who need healing touch today, Jasper, Linda, Linda, Jack, Joyce, and John. Lord, we ask you to continue to guide us and nourish us and refresh us today. Please be with Alan as he preaches your word and just help it be meaningful to us. In your name, amen. God, three in one, we praise you, and at this time we offer ourselves, our very lives unto you for your glory and will. Lord, we pray that you would use our tithes and offerings only for your glory and to expand your kingdom to make known the name of your son, Jesus Christ, whom all our hope rests, Lord. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Kids, you can be dismissed for junior church. So we are continuing in our Genesis series, chapter by chapter, and we've hit a good one today. That's a... Hey, we're looking at, though, how God's story changes, uh, changes our story. How was how God's story intended to change our story? And so last week, you'll remember, we saw Lot, and uh, we saw Lot being rescued by God from the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah before God destroyed the cities. And so now the, the question is, well, what becomes of Lot and his daughters whom God has rescued? And that takes us to chapter 19, verses 30 through 38. Genesis 19, 30 through 38. Follow along as I read from God's word. Now Lot went up from Zor and lived in the hills with his two daughters, for he was afraid to live in Zor. So he lived in a cave with his two daughters. And the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man on earth to come into us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, 
that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she arose. The next day the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay last night with my father. Let us make him drink wine tonight also. Then you go in and lie with him, that we may preserve offspring from our father. So they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him, and he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. Thus both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The firstborn bore a son and, his, and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. The younger also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami, and he is the father of the Ammonites to this day. Let's pray for these words. Heavenly Father, it is not the first time we've come to a chapter of the Bible or a section that we typically like to skip, but we trust that every word in Scripture is your holy word inspired and given to us, your people, to move us, to change us, to conform us, to be like you, or to be like your son, Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray that you would speak to our hearts and our minds now as we put our trust in your word. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So uh, just out of college, uh, I visited Papua New Guinea for six weeks, and uh, I went to a Whitcliffe uh, little compound of missionaries, and so my, my college roommate was a missionary kid from Papua New Guinea. And uh, like many missionary kids, uh, Lance, he had traveled all over the world and seen different parts of the world. Uh, I, on the other hand, had not <laughs> by that point. And so, uh, so after the first few weeks in Papua New Guinea, uh, I experienced what sociologists call culture shock. Culture shock. I, uh, which basically means I had become overwhelmed by the vast differences that I was seeing in the culture around me. And as a result, I began to fear, feel fearful, and I wanted to isolate my, myself. In a sense, I wanted to hide from the world around me. And I was thinking about that uh, this week and how you and I, in some way, have, have been through a bit of a culture shock these last two years. Our once familiar and safe culture at times has felt very other and disorienting. And I'm sure we have all had days when we felt like we were suddenly living in a different culture. And I'm sure we've also had days when we felt a little fearful and we wanted to isolate ourselves. And in some real sense, we've wanted to, to hide from the outside world because we don't want to deal with it anymore. But is hiding the right response for a people who have been rescued by God? Well, maybe, maybe sometimes, but it can't be our new normal. It can't be normal. That's what we see. Today in our text, we see the trouble that can happen when we isolate and sort of, quote unquote, hide in a cave. And, and we see why God has rescued his people and intended for his people to live in community with him and his people, no matter what culture we are in. And so we begin to see kind of by of what not to do, we see also what to do of what is intended for God's rescued people. But let's look at the trouble that happens in a cave. And so the first part of our story, the text, it focuses on fleeing to a cave. Fleeing to a cave. Verse 30 of Genesis 19. We see Lot and his daughters, they flee to a cave out of fear, and they separate themselves, they separate themselves from any kind of community. So look at verse 30. It says, Now Lot went up out of Zor and lived in the hills with his two daughters. And he was afraid to live in Zor, so he lived in a cave with his two daughters. So we're reminded that at one time, Lot was living in this small city called Zor. And you'll remember, he got to that city because God allowed him to go to the city of refuge to, to flee from the destruction that was coming on Sodom and Gomorrah. So this, this city was supposed to be a city of refuge, a city, a, a safe place. But now uh, we see that, that Lot takes his daughters and, and they head to the hills to go live in a cave. Why did Lot make this move? Well, God tells us Lot was afraid to live in Zor. He was afraid. Now, we don't know what he was afraid of. We don't know exactly what he was afraid of. We simply know 
Lot was afraid. He felt fearful. And that fear led him to flee for refuge in a cave. Now, to you and me, that, that might not sound that bad at first. We think, oh, maybe he just wanted a change of scenery. Maybe he wanted a house with a view, right? But we got to remember the context here and the larger scripture narrative that's going on. And so it's not that bad until we, until we think about, thinking of, the, of what we've seen in Genesis so far, where should have Lot fled for refuge? You see, if Lot was afraid to live in Zor, he should have taken his daughters and fled to Abraham. Should have fled to Abraham. Why? Because we, remember what we saw of Abraham before in Genesis. Abraham had actually previously rescued Lot from being a prisoner of war, Genesis 14. Well, Lot already knew that Abraham was the one whom God had made a covenant promise to, a promise of protection and blessing. So there was protection and blessing under the house of Abraham. And we saw as recently as Genesis 18, it was Abraham who, who stood in intercession before God and, and before Lot, between Lot and, and interceded and prayed for Lot's life to be spared from the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah. So all, all the blessings and protection and, and, and leadership that Lot was looking for was under the house of, of Abraham. And so hearing, hearing the, this text for the first time, any Israelite would have wondered, why, why didn't Lot flee to Abraham? Why didn't Lot flee for Abraham? If he was afraid to live in Zor, why didn't he come under the house of Abraham where he would have found the protection and the blessing that he was looking for? Well, unfortunately, we, we know something from, from Lot's past earlier in Genesis that he's a guy who kind of likes to go his own way. And this is what we see Lot doing again. His fear drives him to take his daughters and isolate from the world, living in a cave uh, to hide from his fears. Now, in the ancient Near East, too, at this time, we got to know ca caves were like a place for the dead. People would bury their dead in caves. And, and so just imagine a, a family that you knew, you, you see them setting up their home in a graveyard. You know, what does that tell you about them? It tells you they want to be left alone, right? Who sets up their home in a grave, a place of graveyards? So something like that is happening here with, with Lot because of his fears. He's isolating. He's hiding. And by choosing to hide in a cave with his daughters, uh, he, he's, he's hiding from, from God and from the protection and the blessing uh, of God that comes through community under the household of Abraham. And so at this point in the story, even by verse 1, we're clued in that Lot is not living as someone rescued by God. He's not living as someone who's been rescued by God. Instead, he's living as someone who felt the need to rescue himself. Right? He's living as someone who's trying to rescue himself. And, of course, this is still our temptation today. I mean, think about for a second how often you and I have let our own fears isolate us from people and places. How often... Do we hide from situations and maybe people be, because of our fears? And think about what we're saying in those moments about God. Right? Are, we, are we not in those moments, in those times, telling God, I don't trust you to handle the things that I'm afraid of. And I don't trust you to handle what I'm afraid of. And, and the point is not here, the point is not that isolating or hiding is always wrong. There's always a place for healthy boundaries. That's not what the text is saying. Rather, it's, it's exposing the heart. It's a matter of the heart. When fear comes, where is our trust? When we're afraid, where's our trust? So, for a moment, contrast Lot's actions with what we see in the Psalms with King David. At a time when, when King David was afraid because his enemies were literally surrounding him and trying to kill him, he prayed to the Lord, When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. That's Psalm 56.3. You see, at times, if you know the story of David, you know at times David did hide himself from his enemies. But David had the heart of someone who had been rescued by God. And so David thus believed that God could rescue him again. And you see, God rescued Lot so that Lot would trust in God when he was afraid. So that, so that Lot could see that God is the God who can actually be trusted to, to rescue us again and again and again. And it's the same for, for you and for me. God, through Christ Jesus, has rescued you and me from the punishment 
uh, and his judgment that you and I deserve for our wickedness and our sin. He's, he's called us out of that. That's what Christ Jesus does. He comes and he rescues us out of sort of the, the cities of the wicked into his kingdom. Why? So that we can see that God is the God who rescues and that we can put our trust in him. So that we can know that when we are afraid, God calls us to, to put our trust in him. This is what it looks like to live as a rescued people, a people rescued by God and a people who therefore put our trust in the God who rescues. Well, Lot did not trust in the Lord at this moment, and so he hid and isolated himself from the Lord and the Lord's community. So what happens next? Well, in the next section, we focus on happenings in a cave, happenings in the cave. In verses 31 through 35, we come to the main events of the passage. And we see that a life in hiding and isolation leads to some very twisted thinking and, and gross immorality. And so we come to verse 31. And the firstborn said to the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man on earth to come into us after the manner of all the earth. Now, now just notice here, fear is passed down from generation to generation. Right? The firstborn daughter of Lot expresses her fears and fears to, for her, her family, and she expresses her fears to her sister. The fear, our father's getting old, and there's no men in the whole world for us to marry and to have children by. Now, what? <laughs> like, you just came from the people of Zor. <laughs> well, there's got to be a guy somewhere, right? What about the servants of Abraham? Surely somewhere in the world there are other men. But notice, the isolation and fear together are a poisonous concoction. And drinking this cocktail, Lot's daughter, her thinking becomes quite twisted. Thus, Lot's firstborn daughter hatches a terrible plan. And so she says in verse 32, Come, she says to her sister, come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him that we may preserve offspring from her father. So the daughter's plan is to get her father very, very drunk so that she and her sister can sleep with him and have children by him. And one Bible translation says, let us use him to continue our family line. I think that really captures the heart of what's going on here. The heart of the daughter is to, to just use her father to continue the family line at, at all cost. Now, now, <laughs> this is hard for us to understand, but, but in Lot's day and age, <clears throat> some people would have said, yeah, that's rough, but that's not a bad plan. It's not a bad plan. Because historians tell us that in the ancient Near East, people saw the absence of, of a blood heir uh, meaning that their family would be erased from all history as if they never existed. And this was a real fear. A real fear that you wanted to avoid at all costs, sort of your family line being wiped out of history. Now, it doesn't make it right, but it helps us to understand a little of the desperation of Lot's, uh, Lot's daughter. You see, what's likely going on here is that Lot's daughter, although she had been rescued from Sodom, was still thinking like a citizen of Sodom. And in that culture, somebody probably would have said, yeah, that's rough, but yeah, that makes sense. And so she wasn't looking to the Lord or trusting the Lord for her future. If she had, she would have prayed something like, Lord God, who rescued me from judgment, we are afraid for our future. Would you please come rescue us again? Lord God, what do you want us to do in this situation? And Almost certainly, had she prayed some kind of prayer like that, the Lord would have led her to the Abraham's household where God had already promised a future for his community through Abraham's son, Isaac. But like Lot, Lot's firstborn daughter, did not take her fears to God. And he, she did not trust God for her future. Instead, she took matters into her own hands in an attempt to try to preserve her family, in an attempt to try to preserve her future. And so she did what was acceptable, possibly in her culture, but what was sin in the eyes of the Lord. Now, it is very easy and tempting for us to, to see that and just look with disgust and, and say, how could anybody do 
such a thing. But here I would encourage us not to look so much at Lot's daughter's plan, but at her heart. At her heart. And then ask yourself, what have you done out of fear to protect your future? And has it ever led you to sin? Now, I think about one time I was in grad school. I, uh, I, I cheated on an exam in grad school because I was so afraid that if I got a bad grade, my future would be bleak. Now, and I'll honestly, I confessed it to my professor because I felt ashamed, and he gave me the zero that I deserved. So it became much bleaker. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, in that moment, I was almost surprised at how quick I was to sin because I was afraid. How quick I was to sin because I was afraid of what might happen if I don't, you know, do what I think I need to do. And I, I can look back on my life and see so many times that, that f- out of fear led to sin, right? The, the stew of fear in my heart led to the fruit of sin somewhere else. Sin against God, sin against others. And maybe you can look and see in your life those times that fear has led you to sin. Maybe it was something as simple as cheating on your taxes to protect your financial future. Maybe it was just the sin against your family, neglecting, or or maybe a lie you told at work to to protect your future at work. Maybe it's all kinds of different things. But when we look at our heart and we see how fear shapes us and the way that we act and we respond to fear, we often can see ways that that we've sinned against God and against one another. And the point is that fear is very powerful. Fear is very powerful. And when we hide and isolate ourselves from God and his community, in that fear makes us very prone to sin. Makes us very prone to sin in all kinds of ways and come up with all kinds of God-awful plans. And this is what we see in Lot's daughter as they go forward with their horrible plan. And so we come to verse 33. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father. And he, he did not know when she lay down or when she rose. So the daughters somehow get their father very drunk. And it's telling that, that Lot did not say no to this. Like, I mean, whatever they were doing, passing around bottles or wherever, however this was happening, Lot did not say no. And so we, we see something of his heart, that fear and isolation led him to give in to the sin of drunkenness. Rather than being the spiritual leader of his family, he's totally passive in this moment. He's a passive player in their game of sin. And so in Lot's passive role, his firstborn daughters take advantage of him and they, they sleep with them. And the text tells us, he, Lot, did not know when she lay down or when she rose. Lot is so drunk, he has no idea what's happening. Now, we might wonder, how is that even possible? How could this happen? And it's hard to know, and, and God doesn't give us all the details. But in the Bible, God does reveal over and over again, again and again, that even a quote-unquote righteous person can fall prey to the worst of sins, when they cut themselves off from the Lord and his community. Now, instead of seeking the Lord, they just kind of become that passive player, and that's when we're most prone to sin. And this is what we see with Lot. And yet, at this point, the awful plan of the daughters is only halfway complete. And so we come to verse 34. The next day, the firstborn said to the younger, Behold, I lay last night with my father. Let us make him drink wine tonight also. Then you go in and lie with him, that we may preserve offspring from our father. So the next day, the firstborn daughter tells her younger sister, now it's your turn. And the plan's the same. Get dad really drunk and sleep with him so that we can both have children by him. And so we come to verse 35. So they made their father drink wine that night also. And the younger arose and lay with him. And he did not know when she lay down or when she arose. So once again, same plan. The daughters get their father very drunk. Once again, the daughter sleeps with her father. And once again, somehow, Lot is unconscious to the whole ordeal. Now again, we might wonder, how, how, how is that even possible? I was thinking about a story or a historical account that I recently read about uh, Lewis and Clark and uh, you know, Sacagawea as they did the exploration across the, the western country, uh, you know, exploring the Louisiana Purchase and their attempts to find the Northwest pa- Passage. And uh, they, had a, they had a team with them of mostly military men, this exploration team, and one of the things I was surprised to learn in this book is that, uh, that sexual disease was rampant amongst their team. And it happened in part because of the team's interactions with certain Native American tribes. Uh, and these tribes believed that a person's power or skills could be transferred through sexual relations. 
And so some of the men of the tribes would willingly give their wives to the explorers in hopes that they would sleep with them and then somehow get their powers and then come back home and that they could transfer their powers back to the, to the husbands. And, and the wives were totally willing in all of this because they believed the same things too. And so in their attempts to maybe do good for their family, uh, you know, they were clearly doing what was wicked in their sight, in God's sight. Why? Because they, they didn't know God and they didn't know the ways or the laws of God. And something like this is going on with Lot and Lot's daughters. Following the morals of Sodom, uh, even their attempts to do good, you know, have a family, uh, is, sin, is sin before God. The same thing happens today. Right? The, more, the more we hide, the more we isolate from God and his community, uh, if we don't know God and the laws of God, the, the more we are prone to do wickedness in the, in the eyes of God, even in the times that we think we might be doing something good. But you see, God in Christ Jesus rescued us so that we could know him and know his laws, know his ways. I think about the psalmist in Psalm 1, you know, blessed is the person who meditates on the law day and night. He is like a tree planted that bears fruit in every, every season. And so we see the contrast here. Again, Lot and his family now, they are not living as people rescued by God. They are living in opposition to that. But we're seeing now that, that, that God is kind of almost showing us by the counterexample that, that to live as a people rescued by God is to live as people who, who know God and to know his laws and to know his ways, to do what is right in his eyes, for this is how God's people are, are blessed. And to do otherwise is, is to miss out on the blessing that God has for his people and that fulfilling of that promise that went all the way back to Abraham, right? That Abraham was going to be blessed by God so that he could be a blessing to the nations. Lot here is neither being blessed by God or being a blessing to the nations at all. He's missing out entirely. And this is what we see in the next, in the last section here. How Lot and his family, we now see how they miss out on the blessings from God. So we come to the results from a cave. Results from a cave. Now, we'd like to think what happens in the cave stays in the cave, but that is not the case. And so in verses 36 through 38, we see the results of the family's actions. So verse 36, thus both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. Now again, we might, we might wonder, why, why would God let this happen? I mean, why would God quote unquote bless these two sinful women with children Especially in contrast, uh, if you contrast them with, say, Sarah, Abraham's wife, who was faithful to God, yet was unable to get pregnant for a very, very, very long time. Well, the next verses begin to point to us that something, God has, has a greater plan here. And so we come to 37 and 38. The firstborn, uh, the firstborn bore a son and called his name Moab. He is the father of the Moabites to this day. The younger also bore a son and called his name Ben-Ami. He is the father of the Ammonites to this day. So the daughters each give birth to a son. The first daughter gives birth to Moab, and he becomes the father of a nation and people tribes called the Moabites. The second daughter, she gives birth to a son, Ben-Ami. He becomes the father of another tribe slash nation, the Ammonites. Now, both the Moabites and the Ammonites were well known to the sons of Abraham to Israel. Very well known. Nobody had to guess who these people were. These people groups lived near Israel. They were neighbors to Israel. They were not good neighbors. Uh, these tribes worshipped false gods. They were antagonistic towards uh, Israel. And, uh, and like Lot and his daughters, they lo lived outside of God's covenant community, uh, choosing to live their own way and to do what is right in their own eyes. And so we see in their histories, they, they, uh, they are missing out on God's blessing for them and as being part of his community. And at times they're even excluded from that community. We see in Deuteronomy 23, verse 3. And so we see that Lot's choice to hide and live in isolation from God's people and his daughter's sin led to generations of people who followed in their way and lived outside of God's covenant community and thus missed out on uh, knowing the one true God and living under the protection and blessings of God. And that's what we see with the Moabites and the Ammonites. Now, we've got to recognize that, that this is where a lot of people are today. They're, they're living outside of God's 
covenant community. And for some of you, maybe you know, listening or watching or whatever, but uh, that may be your story as well. Even at times, you may feel like an outsider to God's community. Maybe you feel like an outsider because of the, the sins of somebody else. What others did out of fear, their sin has, has separated you from God's people in one way or another. And maybe you've had times where you've explored other paths to spirituality, looking for other ways to have help. Maybe in your heart you've been antagonistic towards God people, God's people at times. And maybe you've recognized that you've missed out on God's blessing for his people. And you feel outside of that. That is, that is our world, too, around us. And so the question is, does that mean that all hope has been lost for for those who feel like they're outsiders looking in. No, not at all. You see, something interesting happens in the story of the Moabites and the Ammonites. In Deuteronomy chapter 2, we see that God told Israel not to conquer those people groups. Why? Because God still had a plan for them. And we see this plan begin to take shape in the Old Testament book of Ruth. Where's Ruth from? Ruth is a Moabite. Ruth is a Moabite. By God's grace and providence, Ruth marries an Israelite named Boaz. And together they have a son, Obed. And Obed has Jesse, and Jesse has David, King David. And from that family line comes Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Matthew 1. And so we see in the peoples of the Moabites and the Ammonites that that God still had a plan to protect them in order to show his plan to save outsiders just like them. To, save his, to show his plan to save them, even people just like them. A plan that started with Ruth, a plan that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. A plan of salvation through Jesus Christ where every outsider could come out from the darkness of their cave and walk into the light of God. That's what Jesus came to be, a light to the Gentiles. A light to to you and me who are once outsiders. God is pursuing uh, such people. In the ministry of Jesus Christ, we see the good news that even our greatest sins or the sins of someone else are no match for God's plan of salvation. In Christ Jesus, we see that, that God actually has a plan for and loves to call outsiders into his kingdom. And in fact, God has had a plan to pursue those quote-unquote outsiders of his kingdom since the very beginning. Remember, the Apostle Paul boldly preached, this is a trustworthy saying, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Today, God in Christ is still pursuing people like the Moabites and the Ammonites and people of all outsiders' nations. That's why he calls his church to go to the nations and to bring the good news of Jesus Christ. Because God in Christ is still drawing the nations to himself. And this is very good news. If you feel like an outsider today, it means that God in Christ is pursuing you. And so what's the response? The response then is not to to see God pursuing us and to be like Lot or Lot's daughters who decided to go it on their own and isolate and hide. But instead the response is to look and turn in faith to Jesus, to humble ourselves in repentance, and to come under the protection and the household of his community. And so let us ask ourselves today, are there ways in which our fears have led us to hide from God and God's people? Are there ways that the sins of others have maybe pushed us away from God? Well, let us say to Jesus anew, rescue me. Let us say to Jesus, here are my fears. Jesus, here I am. Maybe I'm feeling like an outsider, but Jesus, I put my trust in you. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. Jesus, I look to you to preserve my future. I'm taking my hands off the, driving, uh, off the steering wheel. I'm giving up control when I think about my future or the future of my family or the future of this church. Jesus, I look to you to preserve my future. And Jesus, I look to you and desire to live in your community, for I want to experience through you all the promises of protection and blessings of God and the grace of being part of your your people. And then let's think about others, others that we know. Do we know others, outsiders, people conceived in sin, people living in sin, people living in fear and hiding from God in his community? Well, let us remember that Jesus Christ came into the world to save them. 
that he went to the cross for them. He rose from the dead for them. And so let us be a people, inviting them to know Jesus as their Savior, inviting them into God's community established in and through Jesus Christ. Why? So that they would no longer have to live as outsiders, but members of God's covenant community who get to experience the wonderful protections and blessings of God through Jesus Christ each and every day and for all eternity. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you know our hearts wrestle with fear so often, and that fear leads us to do all kinds of horrible things sometimes. Lord, I pray that when we are afraid, we would put our trust in you, that we wouldn't exile ourselves from the community that you have called us to, but we would lean in more, lean in more to Jesus, lean in more to his church, lean in more to our brothers and sisters in the Lord. And Lord, I pray that as we think about and recognize more and more of what you've done for us in and through Christ Jesus, that we, you would open our eyes to other outsiders that you were calling into this community, recognizing that you, this has been your salvation story from the beginning to pursue the nations and people groups that we're so easy to write off, but you, you are pursuing day in and day out. Open our eyes to that work and may we join you in that, that we might invite all outsiders into your kingdom through Jesus Christ and that they might make you Lord and Savior of their life as well. This we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Please stand again and we'll sing together. Lord, have mercy.
be seated. It is a wonderful truth revealed in Scripture over and over again that our God is a merciful God who shows his mercy in and through Jesus Christ. And how we come to the table, a reminder of God's mercy for us in and through Jesus Christ, that we who were once sick and sin and wicked have been drawn into community through faith in Jesus Christ to commune with him and with one another around this table. And so this table is for all who have put their faith in Jesus as Lord over their life and Savior from their sins. And if that's you, you are welcome to this table. So as Christians, let us confess our faith, this time using words from Colossians 1. Uh, join me in saying these words. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. As the good news about who Jesus is and what he has done. We remember that on the night that he was arrested, he was in the upper room with his disciples, and there he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, This cup is the cup of the new covenant, sealed in my blood and shed for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. And the Bible tells us that when we, as the people of God, gather together to eat and drink of these elements, we proclaim the death of Jesus until he returns. Let us pray for these elements that we're about to receive. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the simple bread, the simple juice. We thank you that they are signs and symbols of your mercy to us through Christ Jesus. And Lord, we, we thank you for your promise that as we eat and drink of these elements together, that by your Holy Spirit, you give us spiritual life, life in Christ, as we remember what he has done for us. And so, Lord, we pray, would you communicate that life to us, your grace to us, even now, grace-centered through faith in Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite the elders to come up. And um, I'll invite you up in a moment. And if you're unable to come up, Matt will bring you the elements.
as we reflect on the mercies of God given to us in and through Jesus Christ. Jesus' body was, was given for you. Take and eat. His blood was shed for you. Take and drink. Let's pray and give thanks to Jesus. Jesus, we thank you. We thank you that because your body was broken on our behalf, because your blood was spilled for us, that all our sins were washed away and that we could know the full mercy of God coming into your community. Lord, may we walk as people who have been rescued by you, people who are, have received your mercy, that we might bring the good news of your rescue and mercy to the world around us. As we pray in Jesus' name, amen. If you would stand, we'll sing closing this morning, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer.
Hope you stick around for Sunday school afterwards. And as always, if there's any way we can be praying for you, our prayer team will be up front. They would love to pray with you today. Receive now your benediction. May you know that God has rescued you in and through Jesus Christ to make you part of his covenant community. And so God, therefore, in Christ says, I am for you. I am with you. You can trust me always, each and every day. Go in peace. Amen. Thank you.